in the 1992 edition on page 126, there's something to show here because I didn't pull it up. We have a section um, <clears throat> in a chapter. Let's see, I can't remember what the chapter is called. The chapter is basically about what you should be eating um, and how to stay healthy. And um, there's a section called Fat People. To be fat, to be very fat is not healthy, it begins. Okay. Uh, that same section in the 2022 edition, you want to guess? What's the same section called in 2022? Um, <laughs> same section. It's it's not terrible. Like it's it's it didn't go full stupid. But right. It's creeping stupidity, I think. Right. That same section, same page. Like again, they really did make it easy to compare editions here. Um, in the 2022 edition, are called people who are too heavy. To be very fat is not healthy. Very heavy people are more likely to get high blood pressure, etc. So they didn't actually change any of the conclusions. They just took out the word fat. They yeah, actually that one. Mm. Okay, so um, in 1992, there was a section on uh, fertility in which they wrote, men and women who are not able to have children, et cetera, et cetera. And they changed that phrase in 2022 to people who are not able to have children. Okay. Some of whom are men and women. Well, no, actually in this case. So, oh, there's intersex people. Like, you know what? Intersex people are generally not going to have an easy time having children. And if they are, then they are doing so as a man or a woman. So it's men and women who have children, not some third imaginary sex, right? So that's just creepingly stupid, actually. Uh, words like sterility have been removed. I don't know why. They're talking about sterility and they just like use different words now. And sex is often disappeared, but not always, even in chapters entirely about reproduction. So, for instance, in 1992, men are sometimes unable to make women pregnant because they have fewer sperms than usual. 2022, a person may make fewer sperm than is normal and so be unable to make someone pregnant. Why? Like, just, just why do it? All the chapters on sex, on pregnancy, on childbirth, on family planning, and there are a lot of them in here, have removed some mention of male and female in places, but they've left in others. So it's, it's just a mess. It's just going to be more confusing to people who are trying to use this as an actual manual for, you know, village health care. It's, it's, it's silly, and it's actually potentially bordering on dangerous because you know no one who lives in a village who's dealing with fertility issues or childbirth issues or or any of this is actually confused about who it is who gets pregnant and who it is who, who has the sperm like they're just not confused about it all right this is interesting because yeah. you can imagine that in whatever context it is that the revision was decided upon the yeah. details of what would be changed that a conversation probably unfolded where, well, if we adjust the language so that it can't get us in trouble, it doesn't actually, anybody who reads it is going to know what it means, so. But they didn't do it completely. Well, but never mind that. Let's say they did. But they didn't. Doesn't matter. Let's say they did, okay? If they changed everything so that nobody who disbelieves in two sexes would be offended, right? but anybody who did believe two sexes would know exactly what was being said, then you could argue that the meaning hadn't been lost. However, especially in places where such a book might find itself, mm -hmm. the idea that the language is going to appear to dance around a fiction that's actually biologically settled and not complex, yeah. right, is dangerous. And I wanna tell a little anecdote. Um, as I've mentioned before, my first research gig was in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating experience. I lived uh, in a little town, didn't have, there was not even a phone line into the town. And I and was, was- before cell phones. It was before okay. cell phones. I was living with a Jamaican family and I was brought into their world and I actually got to see how their world worked. And I, they took me in as one of their own, which was a lovely and formative experience for me. The children of this extended clan, so I was in this house that had a yard, but the family was related to a number of other houses. So there were, I don't know, probably 10 kids who followed me around and were interested because I would talk to them about my life, which was very different from theirs. They were very interested to hear what I had to say and I knew things. I was a science you know, student and anyway, so they would ask lots and lots of questions. And you were a decent human being and a, and a, and a stranger in a place with uh, with a, a, a closed, tight knit group, and you were accepted. And so, hey, let's yeah. talk to the new guy. It was it was yeah. uh, 
totally, totally cool, except for one incident where um, uh, I was reading, uh, I think it was The Unbearable Lightness of Being. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> you were reading Kundra and okay. okay. I was reading Kundra okay. and that was fine. But um, I got, I think, to the end of the book and I, I can't remember the book very well, but um, there was a very sad, poignant moment and I was fending off tears and the kids were like interested to come talk to me and I did not want to cry in front of the children. And anyway, so I was like moving into the bush trying to find a place where I could finish reading this book <laughs> and be done with this. But anyway, um, yeah. But anyway, the, oh. so I got a lot of interesting questions from these kids and they were very revealing. Some of these questions were brilliant questions that really made you think about things. And some of the questions were the result of the very provincial circumstances that these kids were mm. living in. And one of the very unfortunate facts of their existence was that the Weekly World News, remember the Weekly World News? Is this like a, a tabloid that would show up in the yeah, like, it was a tabloid a, a, a supermarket checkouts? It used to be, I don't know that it still might still be, but it used to be available at supermarket checkouts. But it was the one, right? The National Enquirer was the one that kind of pretended to be a newspaper and report real stories that were super sensational. Mm. And the Weekly World News was for people who had given up on reality. And it was just the most outlandish stuff, right? Like, you know, woman gives birth to space alien was literally one of these things. Mm -hmm. Somehow, every so often, one of these things would land in this little oh. piece of Jamaica. Yeah. And it looks like a newspaper. And so... Oh, it's news from the United States. Right. They've now, got it going on. How yeah. tragic is yeah. it to have something broadcasting insane nonsense that it's not even clear if it's a joke, mm -hmm. right? Into, you know, backcountry Jamaica where there's nobody to say, yeah, let me explain to you what that newspaper is so you won't take it so damn seriously if you see it. Yeah. Um, so anyway, okay, into that milieu, you've got this insane newspaper that finds its way into these kids hands and this book also might well be in such a place right oh, right and so my point is if this book is skirting around some issue of gender that makes it seem like oh even the medical people are you know being very careful not to say men and women mm -hmm. maybe this is real maybe there are more than two sexes right then the point is it it reinforces that rather than just saying the damn truth yeah and you know okay there's a truth but it hurt my feelings okay <laughs> see ben shapiro about that right but um so Check anyway in with reality and get back to me or don't right so i guess i guess what i'm comparing was, there, my was mind, there a particular incident that you that you wanted to relate yeah to? yeah i think it was it was actually this question of woman gives birth to space alien mm, okay. and they wanted to know if this had in fact happened it was like, I mean, how would they know that it didn't, right? Yeah. But how, if, let's suppose that I hadn't been there and they hadn't asked anybody who could straighten them out on this issue, you might think, well, I don't know that a woman gave birth to a space alien, but it but did, I did read it once. I did read it, so I have mm -hmm. to leave that possibility open. Well, how much educational so the kid, harm? The kids, the kids were literate? Were they, were they reading this? Yeah. Or, or, yeah. yeah, they were in school. Yeah. And okay. uh, as I've mentioned before, they were bilingual without realizing it because right. they spoke Patois and English, yeah. and which made me frustrating to them. Because, but, it, but they thought they only spoke one language. Right. They thought it was one thing because yeah. they moved seamlessly between them. And I spoke English very well, and struggled the whole time with Patois. Mm -hmm. And so when they would say things to me in Patois and I would not understand them, they would be like, What are you, dumb? Are you, what are you doing? Like, <laughs> stop that. You know what we're saying. And so anyway, it was, it was a fascinating experience. But if you compare the high-minded, uh, you know, discussion at the publisher surrounded by whiteboards around the big laminate, <laughs> A conference table in which they decided what to delicately change in some way that left the meaning there for whoever wanted to find it. Yeah. And then the harm done where this book finds itself into the hands of somebody who just wants to know what the hell is going on. And the book implies by being very strange with language that men and women, are, that's not, those categories aren't as good as we once thought. Yeah. And some fool has told them the same thing. Right, that's that's a tragedy. You'd need, the book just needs to be straightforward. It's yes. a medical book designed to tell yes. you what to do in the absence of an authority. That's its purpose. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, just a couple more examples of some changes that I find suggestive of creeping 
stupidity, uh, and then we'll talk about the ways that their um, the recommendations around vaccinations have changed. Uh, in their chapter, How to Stay Healthy During Pregnancy, or the section called How to Stay Healthy During Pregnancy in 1992, they say, continue to work and get exercise, but try not to get too tired. In 2022, try to rest more, but also get some exercise. Now, most people probably just go right by that and not even notice that there's been a change. The fact that so much in these two editions is unchanged makes it really, really clear that that is a change. And it is a bad change. It is a stupid change. Uh, the idea that now you're basically telling pregnant women that they are, you know, delicate, fragile, precious flowers who are going to do themselves a service uh, by trying not to do too much and definitely not continuing on with their lives. And that's actually, in all but a few cases, going to result in worse outcomes. Uh, you know, the, the less fit you are as you go into childbirth, uh, the more likely you are to have complications. So, you know, try to rest more, but also get some exercise. It flips the, the thing that you should be prioritizing on its head. Now, I could see... I could see a possibly feminist argument for, for getting rid of the first framing, which was continue to work and get exercise, but try not to get too tired. You know, continue to work and get exercise. Definitely, you know, get down there and scrub the floors because that's your job, woman. I don't read it that way at all. And frankly, I think that the, that the move away from encouraging women to continue to do what they do while they are pregnant until they can't anymore, because there does become a point where just like, just get this out of me. I'm just, I'm done here. Um, it's, it's, anti-feminist actually this is this is this is a dangerous thing uh, which we see in our culture moving women away from being you know we were moving in the right direction of you know what you know you're different men and women are different and there's going to be different constraints and different possibilities and you can try for anything you want and also if you if you are going to get pregnant and have a child there are going to be limitations on what you can do but don't limit yourself on the voice of an authority from outside listen to your own body listen you know listen to your kinfolk like listen to your mother and your sisters and your midwife and your doula and you know, all of these people and say you know what i feel like i feel like i should be walking right now then go walk like that's what you should be doing not taking a book that is decided you know what try to rest more um but also get some exercise it feels like it flips which it ought actually be being done on its yeah end. it actually sounds conservative but it's radical yeah. Right. It, yeah. And it flies in the face. I mean, and this is really, frankly, a problem for medicine as it is currently understood. It flies in the face of obvious evolutionary logic. Yeah. Right. Yes. The answer Again. is to the extent that you should be limited by pregnancy and you should alter what you're doing, you're probably programmed to know it, especially with respect to activity. Right. right. It's one thing with respect to a modern food that your ancestors may not have encountered and therefore you might be sensitive to something and you wouldn't have a detector for it or whatever. But with respect to something that every single human female ancestor did while pregnant up until five minutes ago, the answer is you probably have an internal guide to mm -hmm. how far you can push it. Yep. And Listen to that. Listen to that. And so, you know, I guess what I'm... <clears throat> Uh, what I'm getting from this is there's a lot of stuff in medicine that instead of taking the um, do not disrupt that which works, that that should, you know, that's like above even the Hippocratic Oath, mm -hmm. right? It's like the central principle. Don't disrupt something that works, right? Just because you think you know how to make it better because you're not going to make it better, yeah, right? Don't make the mistake of Chesterton's fence. Right. So as far as things that aren't working, what you should, should you do? You should try to restore the conditions in which the body's natural ability to fix this thing functions to the extent possible, right? And then there comes a point at which you don't have a choice, right? You've got a tumor for whatever reason, cutting mm -hmm. it out of you is yep. the mechanism, using antibiotics to prevent infection at the site, it all makes sense. But the basic point is there should be a strong bias in the direction of doing what made sense yes. uh, in ancestral times, not disrupting those patterns as much as you can avoid disrupting them, being especially cautious about development, um, intervening as little as possible, as being as sparing as possible. And if it should show up anywhere, it's in this book. Yeah. And it is here in this book well, in some ways, but that, it's that degrading. Bias, yes, that bias is strong and exists in this book in a, in a good way, but it is disappearing a little bit. And... And there's one notable exception, which I'm about to get to, which is uh, which is with regard to vaccines. 
Um, but just one more example from their section called How to Stay Healthy During Pregnancy. In the 1992 edition, they say, avoid taking medicines if at all possible. Full stop. That's that's the advice. In 2022, they say, they say avoid taking medicines, and they take out the if at all possible. And then later in that same little bullet point, they say, get up to date on vaccinations and tested for HIV. And <clears throat> the increasing recommendation uh, for women who are pregnant to be getting vaccinations is concerning to me. And I have not seen, I don't know if it exists, a good history of what recommendations have been made when. I have increasingly been hearing, in fact, just this week, um, we have a friend who's pregnant who asked me, I uh, said, hey, I've been recommended that I get this thing during pregnancy, uh, this, this vaccine. And, you know, my sense 20 years ago, you know, when, when we were using this 1992 version of this book, long before I was pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, was like, that's not, that's not when you do that. You go into pregnancy healthy you, and you don't put new adjuvants and introduce new possible pathogens into you at that point. Like, that's not, that's not what you do. No, it, and the fact is, it speaks to the same hubris, right? What are the chances that medicine understands the placenta well enough to know how it is going to react to a vaccinated mother, right? right? I mean, A, I yeah. would just point out, the uh, developing fetus is spectacularly well insulated from pathogens by a very ancient mechanism, right? right? So the question is, okay, is the mother more vulnerable during this period? Is the mother's illness a greater threat to the uh, growing infant than the novelty of the intervention, right? These are complex questions. And the idea that medicine has looked at them carefully, studied them, figured out the answers, and it turns out that a cost-benefit analysis makes it uh, better to vaccinate a pregnant woman than to hold off, I don't believe it. No, I, I don't, don't, I don't believe, believe it, it either. Yeah. And I think... Um, there is a there is a larger burden on a pregnant woman uh, or a woman or a family with a newborn uh, to work harder to uh, not be exposed to certain pathogens. And it can feel constraining and it can feel unfair if what you thought was every human should have access to exactly the same choices and decisions about how to spend every moment of their time as every other human. Well, that's not true. Like if, if, if that's your sense of why it's unfair, then, you're, then you've just been you know, betrayed by reality and there's nothing to be done about it. Uh, so you know, if, if you're pregnant, you should work harder to avoid pathogens than uh, when, when you're not pregnant, just as if you're immunocompromised. Like, I'm sorry that you're immunocompromised and that that puts in a greater burden on you. That happened, and now it is imp more important for you than some for someone who is not immunocompromised to work very hard to avoid pathogens. Same thing when you're pregnant, same thing when you've got a newborn. And um, doing so behaviorally through your own choices of how to move around the world, as opposed to imagining that um, you know these reductionist, anti-evolutionary, non-thinking uh, you know, doctors can deliver unto you a magic shot or a magic pill, and that will solve all of the problems. Those things don't exist. And, you know, I say that, again, as someone who is, um, you know, enthusiastic about vaccines in general and enthusiastic about antibiotics in general, and there's just a lot of moments when neither are the appropriate move. And the 1992 version of this book did a very good job of saying, uh, you know, their you know children should get these recommended vaccinations, and uh, and that will help protect them against these these very debilitating diseases. And what has happened in the 2022 edition on this question is is a little bit shocking. Mm -hmm.